reading is going to be from Romans, not Ron, <laughs> Romans chapter 1, oh I'm sorry, chapter 9, uh, 10, oh, gosh, <laughs> chapter 10, 1 through 4. So you threw me off by the Ron thing. <laughs> That's an inside thing. I'll be reading from ESV and it'll be Romans 10, 1 through 4. Brothers, my heart desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they all have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The air is speaking, doesn't it? <laughs> I uh, sent him a text message, Paul, to ask him if he'd be the scripture reader tonight. And my fingers, my fat fingers, don't always hit the keys right on my phone. And I sent him and asked him to, if he would read tonight from the book of Ron, <laughs> chapter 10, 1 through 4. And he texted me back, wanted to know if, if I had created and made a new book and inserted it in the Bible. In any case, so that's what he was talking about. Good to have you with us uh, this evening. Very good. Good to see Bob and Dodie Champion with us, and I understand Bob had not been feeling the best here lately, and uh, glad that you're doing better, able to be here. I believe I think I understood you correctly. Coming up pretty quickly soon, you're going to be going to Texas, as your mother has very, very, been very ill back there and be gone for a couple of weeks, and we want to wish them the very best in their travels. They'll be flying back to Texas and be there for about two weeks is my understanding. Anyway, great to have you here this evening, and I do appreciate the scripture reading truly do. Uh, it is a remarkable passage uh, that I want us to consider when we talk about, uh, let's get out of that. Let's see here. There we go. A remarkable passage in Romans chapter 10. And no one, absolutely no one, can doubt the Apostle Paul's sincere, intense love and concern that he constantly displayed for his Jewish brethren in the flesh. Paul was, deep, deep down, a very much Jewish man, greatly so. Evidently, his father was a Pharisee. He referred to himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. One who had been instructed and taught at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the most celebrated Pharisees of that day. A man who was zealous concerning the law, of which he even at one time said he was blameless from the standpoint that he sincerely tried to follow the law to the best of his ability, didn't keep it perfectly as no one did other than Jesus. But this man understood the importance of God's law to the Jews. He had such great emotion for his Jewish brethren in the flesh. And we know that the vast majority of Jews in the first century time, from the time of Christ's ministry to the establishment of Christ's church in Acts 2, and into those years that would ensue, that the far, far majority of Jews within this great nation that had been God's chosen people to bring forth the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and yet what did the vast majority of them do concerning Jesus? Rejected him. Paul's emotions are very much articulated in this text of Romans chapter 10. And when he says in verse 1, brethren, writing to the church at Rome, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Do we suppose for a moment that Paul was praying that God would save Israel in their rejection of Jesus? Of course not. That God would go ahead and save these people along with anybody while still in sin? No, we know better than that. But was it not Paul's earnest prayer that these Jews would come, in fact, to the knowledge of the truth and would accept the Messiah, Jesus Christ, 
and come into this covenant relationship with God. They thought they were in covenant relationship with God, but they were not. Because that relationship can only be achieved in Jesus Christ. How many people, I ask of ourselves, have you prayed to God that they might come to salvation? Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's been a childhood friend, somebody that you considered as a best friend since the time you were young. How many people do we know? And some of these people that may think that they're very much in a great relationship with God, that they're religious people, and yet we know that the relationship based upon Scripture is not correct. And we pray to God that somehow that they could come to terms with salvation. Have we not all, I'll tell you, I don't know how many people I have and continue to pray for that very thing. People that are very near and dear to me. To the intensity of which Paul loved these brethren and wanted this so much, is he makes a very remarkable statement in the preceding chapter, if you go to chapter 9. Somewhat of a controversial passage. <clears throat> but in Romans chapter 9, in verse 3, <clears throat> excuse me, if you'll notice in Romans chapter 9 and verse 3, Paul said, For I could wish that I myself were accursed. That's anathema. For I could wish that I myself were accursed for Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. What makes this passage controversial is that there would some that might look at this and say, I cannot believe for a moment that the Apostle Paul would be willing to sacrifice to give up his own salvation for anybody, let alone a nation of people that have rejected Christ. And so in answer to that, or because of that, some have tried to explain that this word anathema, cursed, can simply mean devoted to. And that since, well, since Paul was an apostle primarily to who? The Gentiles. That he wished that he could be devoted to the preaching of Israel. In my own problems with the passage for a long time, I kind of wanted to believe that. But I think we're missing the point of Paul's point. And first of all, it's why the translations are very, very good in having when Paul says, For I could wish. He knew this was something that he in reality could not do. When we are in a right relationship with God, and while there are people that we love, family and friends, that we wish they would come to Christ, tell me, could any of us give ourselves up that they would be saved? The sacrifice has already been made. It's Christ. They have to come to Christ, not me. And so when he says, for I could wish that myself accursed... He knew this was not something he could do in reality, but you want to know something? The sentiment and the attitude absolutely parallels what Moses said in the Old Testament. Take your Bibles and turn back to the book of Exodus, would you? In Exodus chapter 33, 32 rather, Exodus chapter 32, and we're going to look at verses 30 through 33. What has happened in Exodus 32? Moses is up on Mount Sinai. What is he receiving up in Mount Sinai? The law, the Ten Commandments. Joshua is not too far away. Moses descends from Mount Sinai, and Joshua hears all of this noise. And Joshua is confused to what this noise would be. Is it the sound of, of war? Is it the sound? What is it? And yet Moses knew what was going on, because while Moses was up on Mount Sinai, what was Israel? What were the Israelites doing? I tell you, they had constructed a golden calf. They were engaged in paganistic, idolatrous worship. It had turned into revelry. It was so unholy, ungodly. And God had made the decision that once Moses comes down, and what is God ready to do with the Israelites? He is ready to destroy them all because of their sin. Moses intercedes. 
chapter 32, beginning at verse 30. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Listen to this carefully. Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now, is God going to, for a moment, blot Moses' name out of the book of life in order to spare the rest of Israel? No. And were there some, thousands indeed, that paid for the penalty of that sin that day as the Lord opened the earth and swallowed them? And this is even after Moses had done what with the gold calf? Ground it into gold powder, mixed it into water, and made those people drink it. And then the, the Lord swallowed up thousands in death. But I want you to notice the sentiment because how much did Moses love his people? Lord, if you'll spare them. If you'll spare them from this. And if not, blot my name out. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure that I would so readily take that attitude towards people. Family and friends that are lost say, Lord... I'll give up my salvation. I'll be accursed that they may be saved. But you know what? It's not going to happen that way. And Paul says, for I could wish. And it wasn't going to happen. What I want us to see, though, is that the Apostle Paul is going to be very, very critical of the Jewish nation in these verses. And rightfully so as an Apostle Jesus Christ. He's not going to be ugly about it, but he's going to be honest and straightforward about it. He loved them. He did not bear malice. He was not going to enjoy the things that he would have to write from time to time, the things that he would have to say from time to time to these people. It gave him no pleasure, no joy whatsoever. And I believe that anybody in their preaching or their teaching of of the truth of God's word, that we would never ever get any kind of joy or pleasure even in exposing the air in fact It really bothers me when sometimes that attitude comes across that if we even expose the error of others, that if we are sarcastic or even have a smirk or a grin on our face about it as though we're so right and they're so wrong. And we may be and they may be wrong. But I'll tell you, that's no attitude to have. Does that make sense? Paul, again, was primarily an apostle to the Gentiles. Turn over now back to the New Testament, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And as you're turning there, let me say that you may have ever thoughts about Romans 10 and Romans 9, 3. And you know what? Something that we just need to study and think about. As I like to say every once in a while, chew on it. But I know this, that how Paul so much desired that he could be some kind of an influence to his Jewish brethren in the flesh that they could come to Christ. Remember there in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 7, when Paul writes to the churches of Galatia, and he's talking about his goal and responsibility in preaching, and he he has just given the history about his own conversion and and so forth. And then in chapter 2 and verse 7, he says, But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised, who is that? The Gentiles, the uncircumcised have been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised, who's that, the Jews, have been committed to who? Peter. And primarily, generally speaking, that was true. That Peter had spent the bulk of his ministry, even as an apostle, ministering and preaching to Jews. Paul, in his evangelistic journey, spent so much of his time, and while he would often go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he would try to preach to Israel when he could, but they so many times summarily rejected him, and he says, Lo, I go to the Gentiles. Remember that? But he had been chosen by God to be this one that would present the gospel to Gentiles. And what I want us to understand is that while Paul primarily was this apostle to the Gentiles, it did not diminish 
His concern for his Jewish brethren. How he wished that he could be an influence on them. And so, now what does he do? Going back to our text of Romans chapter 10, please. Go back to Romans chapter 10. And after in verse 1 that he has said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now let's notice, notice verses 2 and 3 of Romans chapter 10. Verses 2 and 3. For I bear them record. Who? Them? Israel. For I bear them record, or bear them witness, your translation may say, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. I'll tell you what that so very well sums up overall the condition and the attitude of the Jewish nation of this day. So many of them were zealous as Jews. Zealous for the law, zealous for Israel, zealous for tradition. And yet he says, I, I bear them record. I, I, I give them this. We can almost put this in our vernacular today. I'll give them this much credit. They got zeal. But what? Not according to knowledge. And one of the things I want to really stress as we go through this and make these few points in this lesson tonight is to let you to let us be reminded that knowledge is important of God's word because an appropriate accurate knowledge of God's word will always temper zeal it will serve as a governor because zeal without knowledge and here's the point I'm going to say it several times is dangerous it is critically dangerous Paul is revealing Israel's spiritual condition. And here again is this danger. I know in teaching classes, and many of you have heard me say this before, in a lot of different matters, and I'll make these points, and, we'll, and I'll say, you know what? The red lights are flashing. And the, and the signs is sign is saying, danger, danger, danger. And this is what Paul is really doing in this letter and in this section. That not according to knowledge, that no matter how zealous they are, how much fervor they have, or even how sincere they are, that zeal and fervor and even sincerity without knowledge is dangerous. Let's talk about this zeal without knowledge. Zeal without knowledge, yes, is dangerous. And I was having a class uh, early Friday morning with uh, Davy Smith. And just interesting, I find that, that I do this a lot with, with Davy. We're going through the book of James. We're in chapter 4 right now. And what a practical book. It's a fabulous, fabulous study. I've done this with many of you. I've gone through the book of James with many of you in private studies. And we're talking about, at the end of chapter 3, we've just transitioned to chapter 4, but we were just talking about the wisdom. Remember the contrast of the wisdom in the book of James, the wisdom that comes from above as opposed to the wisdom that is earthly, sensual, demonic, and so forth. And the danger, the danger of earthly, worldly, sensual wisdom. And that there are a lot of people that get very eager and filled with fervor and zeal about things, even religiously. But again, when they don't know scripture and they don't have the knowledge of God's word like they should, but they have a lot of zeal. Oh, boy, can that lead to problems. And I end up with David a lot of times using, because it's so natural in talking with him, of using analogies and illustrations regarding law enforcement. I'm a cop's kid. My father was law enforcement for a good number of years. My brother was law enforcement. My grandfather was law enforcement. He was the first chief of police in Pismo Beach. I had so many in law enforcement. My namesake, Brent, was in law enforcement for years. My son, Clint, is in law enforcement. I know it seems easy to me to give analogies about law enforcement. The best thing I can say about law enforcement is this. I'm a preacher. <laughs> well, anyway, you just think about that. But when we're talking about this, can you imagine someone going into law enforcement, and they do an incredible amount of training. They, they, they have academy. They have long training. 
They have the academy, post-academy. They have all this because they're in these various situations. And when you're in law enforcement, obviously, are these situations that can be very dangerous. And what they train these, these men and women to do that are in law enforcement is that when you come upon circumstances, and they may be gung-ho, and they may be just filled with fervor, and, and you can see maybe even some of the rookies, that they're ready to get out there and do what? I mean, they're going to go out there and just keep the streets safe and going to get the bad guys. And, and I'm, am I glad there's people that want to get the bad guys? But when you have a lot of zeal and fervor, but then don't incorporate the things that they're taught at the academy, that is the knowledge of how to handle and even diffuse situations, they can get themselves and other people in trouble quickly. And somebody may get hurt, somebody may get killed. It's serious business. Zeal without knowledge is dangerous. Zeal without knowledge, religiously, spiritually speaking, I want to suggest to you, leads to anomian practices. And you say, what anomian practices? And there is even something that is referred to as the spirit of anomianism today. And that is this very idea or attitude of being religious and being spiritual, but doing things outside of the authority of God's word. And it is here that we go to the text that we're very familiar with in Matthew chapter 7. I alluded to verse 21, only 21 in this morning's lesson, when we talk about God's way of salvation, the divine side and the human side. But I want to call your attention back to Matthew chapter 7, and it is here in verse chapter 7 verse 21 when Jesus says again not everyone that says to me Lord Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven but then you notice in verse number 22 look at it closely for many will come to me in that day and in that day which is a setting of judgment in that day they will say to me Lord Lord have we not prophesied in your name cast out demons in your name and done many marvels, or done many wonderful works, depending on the translation you may be using, but done many wonderful things or works in your name. I want to ask you a question right now. Were they doing what appears to be seemingly good works, prophesying, casting out demons, and wonderful good works, were they doing it in the name of Jesus? That's what it says. But what will the Lord respond to these in this situation? In verse 23, But I will say to them, Depart from me, the verb we've been studying in 1 Timothy 4 for quite a while, the departure from the faith, the leaving the faith. But I will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. You who practice what? Lawlessness, wickedness, iniquity. Translations. Lawlessness. The word is anomia. Our word for law is nomos, N-O-M-O-S. We put an A in front of it. What does that do? negates it without law. And anomian practices are things that are practiced when we talk about the Bible and the work and the mission of the church and that what we should do as Christians. That anomian practices are practices that are done even if they're done in the name of Jesus. Even if they're done seemingly with good intentions and good motive, but if there are things that are outside the boundaries of law, they are anomia, they're without law, without authority. There you have it. Zeal without knowledge will often do that. Because people get very zealous and they'll say, I think this will be a great idea because this is going to help promote growth numerically or growth spiritually or this is going to be good or that. And, and sometimes there's a fervor and there's a zeal. I just think this is a great thing to do, but then people don't always stop to think and ask the first basic question, which is what? What do the scriptures say and what do the scriptures authorize? Do we understand that in the pale of so-called evangelical Christianity today, that so many people don't even begin to think about that question, let alone ever practice or incorporate, incorporate it by asking, but what does the Bible teach? What does the Bible say? When we look at the long curve of history, religiously in Christianity, what's called Christianity, Christianity, 
And I mean from the centuries and centuries of the Roman church and even up to the Protestant Reformation of the 17th, of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries that we look at this and we understand that yes, there were some that said we need to get back to the Bible, but there was this general attitude that many things could be done and practiced and it was never really asked, what do the scriptures say? How is this to be authorized? Seemingly good works in Jesus' name. It's simply this, we've got to tell you, I've got to say to you, it sounds good, but can we show it legitimately according to Scripture? He says, you who practice lawlessness, in verse 23, you who practice lawlessness, and I'm going to want to ask one of the questions before we finish this and go to our second point, but, and I want you to think about this very carefully in your minds, even before you answer it. When Jesus said, you who practice lawlessness, these people are going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And that's, that is, he's saying, we didn't have a relationship. Right? I never knew you? In this text and in this context, was Jesus accusing these individuals of being gross immoral, of gross immorality? Was he accusing that they were guilty of sins like adultery, thievery, Murder, even lying, covetousness. No. Were they, in fact, religious people doing things that appear to be good in their minds in the name of Jesus? But what was the problem? Sounds good, but it is anomia, lawlessness without authority. Does that make sense to everyone? This is the problem of zeal without knowledge. It will lead to practices that cannot be authorized by Scripture. And we have the examples even in the New Testament, a lot of different kinds of examples. We could talk about the Judaizers. We could talk about the Gnostics. We could talk about people with pagan, idolatrous, Gentile back backgrounds. But just think about the Judaizers. Even the Judaizers that found their way into the church at various places, what were they constantly trying to do? And they may have been very zealous, and they may have been very sincere, but they are trying to bind the tenets of the old law, the old law of Moses, and they're trying to bind those tenets on others, including Gentile believers now. And it could have been dietary regulations, it could have been circumcision, it could have been the keeping of special days from the Sabbath to the new moons to the feast days. It could be a variety of things under the old law. And were they often sincere about this? Yes. Were they zealous? No question. But without knowledge. Very quickly, turn over to Colossians chapter 2. And then we'll go to our next point. Because this is hugely important in Colossians chapter 2. And Paul reminds these Christians in Colossae, beginning of verse 11, in him that is in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. Would you look at that with me, please? We're going to read a little bit here. In him... That's Christ. You were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This is not talking about physical circumcision that they did with little Jewish boys at eight days old. It's not talking about that. A circumcision without hands, and we know what this circumcision is. Verse 12. Look at verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Brethren and friends, when we were baptized into Christ, we then did what? We were, in this metaphor, spiritually circumcised, weren't we? It's not a circumcision of the flesh, but it's a circumcision in the putting off of the body of sins. Buried with him in baptism. You cannot experience that unless you're buried with him in baptism. That's the problem of salvation at the point of faith before baptism. It doesn't fit the scriptural model at all. It certainly doesn't fit this. Verse 13, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, because that's what, what one is before they're baptized in the Christ. They're just dead in sin. That body of sin has not been cut off. He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. Handwriting of requirements, Paul says, it was against us. What handwriting was that? Well, read on. 
And He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I want to ask you, the Old Covenant, the Old Law, the Mosaic Law, and all those tenets, was that been, has that been completely fulfilled? It hasn't been fulfilled, and it is no longer relevant. Oh, it's great history, and it teaches a lot of things, but it's not the law which we are under as Christians today. Having, verse 15, disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, so that no one, and here's how we, why we know he's referring to these ordinances that were nailed to the cross, so to speak. He says, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, and Sabbath plural because they not only honored the weekly Sabbath, they, I'll tell you what, they had a yearly Sabbath. They, 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 they had a, a jubilee Sabbath. They had all of these different, it was a Sabbath. And he said, let no one judge you in reference to that any longer. Under the old law, if somebody went out and decided to just go ahead and work and plow their field, a Jew on the Sabbath day, if a Jew went out on the Sabbath day and plowed his field under that law, what was he subject to? Stoning. Are we to judge people based on that law anymore today? No. It's gone. Verse 20. In fact, verse 17 is which, is our, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. There's the substance. The substance is not of the old law. The substance is not even of Moses. It's of Christ. Verse 20. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why is there living in the world do you subject yourself to regulations, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern, which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the Wow, I could preach till midnight in that passage, but I shall not. Zeal without knowledge is dangerous because it leads to unlawful practices. Now that brings us then to this next point as we continue to explore verses 2 and 3 of our original text up here in Romans chapter 10. And those then that are ignorant of God's righteousness. And let me just tell you of this, this word ignorant. It's not even, a, it, it's, it's kind of in many respects kind of an ugly word. If you went up to somebody and said, you're ignorant. I, well, I suppose somebody came up and said to me, Brent, you're ignorant. I would have to, you know, plead guilty. There are a lot of things about which I am ignorant. The Greek word's even an interesting word. Agnoeo, it's where we get a word agnostic, because what is an agnostic is one that's without knowledge, doesn't know, don't know. And so Paul employs this word, not to know, and it applies to one who lacks knowledge. And again, this is dangerous. What did God say about the people of Israel historically back in the days of Hosea the prophet in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6? Remember what he said about Israel generally speaking in Hosea 4 6? My people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, it goes on to say, I also will reject you from being priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I will also forget your children. People. We're destroyed for lack of knowledge. Isaiah had some, done something very similar. When you go to Isaiah chapter 5, and it, it leads to something interesting, by the way. I want you to first notice Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13. And in Isaiah 5 and verse 13, there the prophet says, and God speaking through the prophet says, Therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Wait a minute, they have the law. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13. Therefore, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. They had the law. I think there were even some smart folks there. But when it says they had no, have no knowledge, it's because they failed to learn the lessons and apply them, right? They're operating, as it were, outside of knowledge. Their honorable men are famished. Their multitude dried up with thirst, as he uses those metaphors. And so look what this leads to. And what this leads to is that when, when people become ignorant of God's righteousness, go down to verse 20. Right there in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. And no wonder. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
that even that society of God's people is supposed to be the covenant people of God because they're operating outside of knowledge, they've got everything backwards, don't they? They call light darkness, darkness light. They call bitter sweet, sweet bitter. Good evil, evil good. And when I read that passage, you know what it very much is descriptive of me? The 21st century world. Don't people do exactly that? And I'll tell you why. Because they're ignorant of God's righteousness. Again, very dangerous. A lack of knowledge. What is the righteousness of God? You know, we have this expression. Ignorant. That's just taken right out of the text. Ignorant of God's righteousness. What is the righteousness of God? It's a genitive form. It's talking about the righteousness that belongs to God. God defines it. It is God who displays it. God is the epitome of righteousness. And we have this word in this diakthune, the quality of being right or just. In fact, it's interesting that in the old, old, old English, we have this English word righteousness today. In the old, old, old English of about five, 600 years ago or whatever it was, it was originally not righteousness. It was right wiseness. Right wiseness. Isn't that interesting? Of knowing what is right and being wise and applying it is righteousness. God is always right. We talk about the righteousness of God. And God is always right. The psalmist declared in the Psalm 33 and verse 4, For the word of the Lord is right, and all of his works done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. God is always right. I don't care what people may ask about judgment and about circumstances with people. And so often, I'll tell people this. I know this. I have this confidence. God will always do the right thing. And when it comes to judgment, God will always do the right thing. When it comes to anything that God does, it's always going to be the right thing He's going to do. The righteousness of God is impeccable. The righteousness of me and the righteousness of you, I'll tell you what, is very sporadic. And we must depend upon the righteousness of God, should we not? God's word, God's testimonies, God's statutes, God's commandments, they are all righteous. Just listen to these very quickly in that beautiful 119th Psalm. It's 176 verses total. The longest chapter, longest psalm and longest chapter if we call the psalm a chapter, which I rarely do. But in Psalm 119, just listen, for example, in 123, my eyes fail from seeking your salvation, your righteous word. Verse 144, the righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. Verse 172, my tongue shall speak of your word for all your commandments are righteousness. And what this does is this gives us a very direct correlation that when we talk about God's righteousness, God's righteousness is associated with what? His word, his commandments, his testimonies, his statutes, the principles that he's given in the oracles of God. And when we are ignorant, don't know, lack knowledge of God's righteousness, then we put ourselves in that realm of danger. Danger. I'm here to tell you not because it pleases me or makes me happy. I'm here to tell you that there are a lot of people that call themselves religious, call themselves Christians, say that they are following Jesus Christ in their minds, but they're ignorant of God's righteousness. They may even have zeal, but it's without knowledge, and they've got themselves in a danger zone. And we don't want to do that. In fact, what did Paul say about the gospel of Christ? The true, pure gospel Christ that I tried to talk about and highlight as much as I could in the time allotted this morning about the divine side of salvation, that the gospel is based upon what? The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what did Paul say about this gospel of Jesus Christ in Romans 1, 16 and 17? He says, yes, I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, also the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, even as it is written, the just shall live by faith. God's righteousness is seen and revealed in the saving, powerful gospel. And yet here's what bothers me. 
How many pulpits and churches and preaching, listen to me, how much preaching short changes the gospel today? And a teaching and a preaching that does not show all of the divine side and does not show, I, I, not everybody was here this morning, but it's on YouTube already. Stuart's already got it posted. Saw it. We got an outline. Look at the passages. But when we remove any of those aspects of hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, and being faithful, even to the point of death. I'll tell you what, you remove any of those and saying, well, no, there's, there's one or two of those that are not necessary to become a Christian, not necessary to get saved. I want to tell you what, it's a short changing of the gospel because people are ignorant of God's righteousness, which has been revealed in the gospel. Last point, we've got to stop. What happens next? You go back to the text. And they being ignorant of God's righteousness. What do they do? They're ignorant of God's righteousness. Seeking to establish their own righteousness. Have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And it becomes a self-made righteousness. They make their own righteousness. Have not submitted to the righteousness of God. In Romans 10.3. You see the next natural step. Is therefore to seek Seeking to establish their own righteousness. When we start ignoring scripture, when we start ignoring precedent, those examples, when we start ignoring the pattern, when we start ignoring scriptures given in their context, I'm going to tell you what, then what we call religion and what we call service and, and dedication to God, when it when we are ignorant of God's righteousness and we do not have that knowledge of God's word and we're not incorporating that knowledge of God's word, then everything that we do that we call religious and Christian, you know what it is? It's self-made righteousness. Somebody says, I think it's this, when obviously gospel, the, the Bible says, says it's this. You know what that is? That's a self-made righteousness. The Jews did it. The Gnostics did it. A lot of people did it and are doing it. That's the next natural step. And so many times it's operated by virtue of what we call mitigation. Well, everybody else is doing it and the majority is. And I'm going to tell you right now. What we preach and teach and hold to right here, as the world looks at it, even an evangelical community, are we holding to mainstream opinions or ideas? No. Are we holding and teaching views? that are just going to be generally accepted in various congregations and pews of this town and many other communities. No, no, no. And people will go to mitigating argumentation and say, well, I'll tell you what, we must be doing something right because the majority feel this way. Well, I'll tell you what, Moses told Israel not to follow the multitude to do evil. And Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to death, and many there be which go in thereat. For straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to salvation, and few there be that find it. And do we think that Jesus had any pleasure in saying that? No. And do we have any pleasure in, in, in even trying to have to, needing to emphasize that today? No. But mitigation justifies nothing. And man-made traditions... We've always done it this way, or we've never done it that way, and whatever the case might be. And how many fall prey to traditions? Because this is what the church has always done, this is what the church has always taught, and we see this, we see that denominationally, and we have to be careful that we don't see it here. Colossians 2 and verse 8. I love the passage. We were in Colossians 2 earlier, but now earlier on in that chapter, verse 8, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, but not according to Christ. I don't care what anybody's traditionally done unless it's the tradition of the apostles because that's God's word. And then there becomes the point that we hold on to our tradition so much and even when it cannot be contextually really contextually supported and so forth and then we start deciding we're going to bind upon others that becomes that's what legalism is I'm not a legalist because I tell you what I believe in obeying the commandments of God the law of God 
But legalism is when we make, we legislate, we make the rules, and then we start binding on others. And I'll tell you what that's called in the book of Titus. It's called heresis is the Greek word. It's a heretic. It's a self-willed opinion. And there in Titus chapter 3 and verse 9, Paul says, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for the unprofitable, they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive, because the heretic is divisive. Reject the divisive man after the first and second admonition. He's been warned once, he's been warned twice, and if he's going to become divisive with his self lit opinion, reject him. Because it's nothing more than a self-made righteousness. i got to stop because I did not want to turn the sermon into a three-part sermon. I could have easily done that. But I, I, I would have heard it from you forever because of what I recently did in a sermon just a few weeks back. So thank you for your patience. But brethren, zeal, even sincerity, without knowledge can be dangerous. Our zeal for the Lord is to be tempered by God's authoritative word Remember, even God's people can be lost for a lack of knowledge. And I hope that you will receive the lesson. And what I'm telling you is the spirit and the attitude of which I've tried to give it. With fervor and zeal, but according to knowledge and a lot of love. If we can help you in your decision to follow Christ, whatever your need may be, we offer you the Lord's invitation at this time. Won't you come at this time as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation?